Our final guest on today's show is Danielle Butt, who is the Director of Communications at Yakad. Now, Yakad is an organization that works for a two-state solution to the Israel-Palestine conflict and advocates for that within the Jewish community in Britain. I'm only speaking to Danielle now about the uh, the situation in Israel right now with the judicial reforms that Benjamin Netanyahu has attempted to introduce, the protest movement that has erupted as a result of that, and the impacts that's had on attitudes towards the government in Israel. Before we delve into any of that, I just wanted to say a massive welcome to you. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. How are you doing today? Hi, I'm good. Thank you very much for having me. I'm um, in a hotel in London, so hopefully the Wi-Fi works okay and you can hear me fine. I can hear you loud and clear at the moment, so let's hope it holds up. Um, so let's dive straight into it then. So for uh, some of our viewers may not have been following the story of what's happening in Israel right now. Um, so for those who haven't been following it, could you talk us through what Netanyahu's government is trying to uh, introduce when it comes to these judicial reforms? Sure. So Netanyahu was re-elected in the end of last year, in November, um, and he has built the most far-right coalition in Israel's history, which is made up of four parties, Netanyahu's Likud, um, two Haredi, which are very ultra-Orthodox religious parties, and one party, which will probably come up in our conversation, which is the Religious Zionist Party, which is an, inc an extremely far-right party, anti-Palestinian, um, anti-LGBT rights, kind of pro-annexation, some might argue pro-apartheid. Um, so ever since Netanyahu's re-election, one of the main things that he and his government have been campaigning on is um, judicial reform or the judicial overhaul. Um, and we would, so people who oppose it would call it an overhaul because it's not just kind of changes to way in which Israel's judiciary works, but rather a complete overhaul of the political system and the, the legal system in Israel. Um, Mainly, it's a way of removing and reducing the checks and balances currently on the government, which are upheld by the Supreme Court. Um, I would argue the Supreme Court is far from perfect, but this is a complete attack on checks and balances and really trying to remove them. But there are not really any checks and balances. I know some people have tried to compare the situation to the US or other countries, but it's simply a false comparison because in the US, you have the Senate and the Congress and the Supreme Court. That is not the case in Israel. You really just have the the sitting government um, and, and the Supreme Court, which decides if to kind of push back against any laws. Um, so it's mainly trying to weaken the Supreme Court to intervene in the uh, choices of Supreme Court justice, justices to make those uh, positions far more political, um, to weaken the current system around legal advisors, to make those appointments again far more political, and as well as legal decisions or legal advice being far less um, uh, some basically so politicians can ignore legal advisors. Um, but also the, the main thing that has been spoken about is the override clause. And the override clause is to say that should the Supreme should the government try and pass a law and the Supreme Court decide that it is not legal um, or might risk people's human rights or whatever else, the government can vote to override the decision of the Supreme Court, which essentially from a civilian perspective takes away any um, protection that civilians have over their human rights, over their civil rights, over their right to free speech. Um, and that's really the thing that's got people most concerned because things like LGBT rights, which a lot of Israelis do believe in, um, anti-racism laws, et cetera, are, are no longer protected in any way, shape or form should this legal overhaul uh, be successful. And so the that's a really helpful overview. Thank you for that. And I guess the 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 immediate thing that's happened following the attempts to introduce this overhaul, as you put it, is it's mm -hmm. it's triggered a mass protest movement against the government and against the the reforms. How widespread have the protests been in Israel against the um, the judicial overhaul? So massively widespread. Spread. Um, and it's quite interesting because obviously you will have people on the right who will try and play these protests, but we really haven't seen protests to this scale across Israel. Um, so they're widespread both in terms of numbers. Every single week you have hundreds of thousands of people out on the streets. Um, usually you would see Tel Aviv is the most liberal city in Israel and you would kind of expect to see protests in Tel Aviv, but actually we've seen protests across Israel. This issue is clearly um, 
crossing socioeconomic divides. We have seen people who are traditionally right-wing protesting, people who are much more pro-military than people like I might be going out and protesting. So it's crossing um, political divides, crossing socioeconomic divides, identity divides. The protests are across Israel, and most importantly, they've been consistent. Um, I think at the beginning, a lot of people worried that you know, the first few weeks, there would be this um, mass protest movement, but we would die down because it's really hard to keep up that level of protest. But actually, we've seen them almost consistently increasing in size. Um, and they've also been very disruptive. So they've kept the issue on the headlines, both nationally and internationally, which is incredibly important because we have seen international support for the protests. There has been protests in London and also other countries in solidarity with uh, Israelis protesting, which means the issue is now an international issue. And you, you've seen also a, a massive intervention from the Biden administration, which is, again, almost unprecedented, this kind of level of international um, concern being expressed against Netanyahu. And so obviously, in the last few years, we've seen, I mean, the Israeli government has, has had various iterations over the last few years with um you know, the, the various elections and the, the various formations of the government. But essentially, the, the one theme throughout the last few years has been that it's been moving further and further to the, to the right throughout those iterations. And I guess the, the judicial reforms or overhaul, however we describe it, is kind of like a, a clear iteration of, of that. But mm-hmm. I guess, what's your, what's your assessment of how this, uh, the, the, this these proposed reforms uh, are sort of existing as a, as a totemic issue, which is shifting uh, attitudes towards the government within Israel? So I think it's been quite, it's really interesting. I think abroad people view Israel from the lens of Israel-Palestine, which is very fair. And obviously that's the field that we work in and we would support that. But internally in Israel, um, it's really been a clash over what Israeli identity is. A lot of internal issues around um, Mizrahi and Ashkenazi Jews and um, racial issues and kind of Jews of color and how they often are more discriminated against and things like that. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's a very different battle internally. A lot of it's also a socioeconomic ba- battle. Um, the assumption that people who protest are more liberal and therefore more privileged, etc. cetera. Um, in terms of the attitudes to the government, there are always going to be the hardline supporters of Netanyahu. He has a very, very strong base. That's why he succeeded so well. His party is also one of the most long-standing standing parties in, in the Israeli Knesset. Um, however, if you look at most recent polling, we've seen a massive reduction in support for these um, the, the current government parties. We have seen more people, especially over security. Um, so most of the parties in government have uh, their campaign platform is around security, saying, you know, we have issues, not just from uh, in the, on the Palestinian conflict, but issues in the south of Israel, with security, um, conflict with Bedouin Arabs, etc. And the, the platform has been around, we were, we we're going to keep you safe. And clearly, if you look at the past couple of days, this government is doing the opposite. We've now got conflict with Lebanon, conflict with Syria, conflict with on the Gazan border. We've had several terror attacks. We've had several incidents of violence um, in the West Bank. Um, and I think it's really shifting attitudes and people saying, actually, this government is not keeping us safe. Um, it's off. Many of its ministers are not being taken seriously. And, and the polling does support that. Um, and I, I also think that um, the protests have raised awareness for a lot of people. Again, there are people who are frustrated by the protests, there are people who don't support them, people who stand by their support for Netanyahu and for uh, Itamar ben and Smotrich and others. But I, I do think there has been a, um, a shift because the government is not proving itself to be effective. And in addition to the security issue, we're clearly facing uh, an economic crisis because Every and I'm not I'm absolutely not an expert in common economy, but every economic expert pretty much has warned that this judicial reform is going to be bad for Israel's economy. And we have seen a rise in prices in Israel um, and the cost of living. And so people's lives are very quickly being affected negatively, which I think for will sh- is going to shift some attitudes in that. According to the most recent poll that came out, if, the, if an election was held today, this, gov- this government would not stand. Um, I think it's probably too early for an election, but but that's uh, it, it is affecting it negatively. And so the other area I guess I'm interested in in relation to this is we've also seen not just protests in Israel itself, but we've seen protests across the world, uh, including mm-hmm. in cities in the UK, 
um, in response to the the uh, Netanyahu's um, government and its actions around the judicial reforms. Mm-hmm. And obviously, you know, protests about the Israeli government's um, actions are, aren't particularly rare in the UK. You know, that's quite a common feature. But I guess these are very different in that um, we've seen protests led and organised by the Jewish community in the UK, by people who would describe themselves as Zionists and people who are pro-Israel, organising and campaigning and protesting against uh, these um, these reforms. And I'm, I find this, I'm really interested to, to, to hear what you think about the impact that the that this policy could have on um, attitudes towards the Israeli government and the Israeli state um, in sort of Jewish diaspora communities rather than just within Israel. Yeah, so I think I'll speak particularly to London because I'm more aware of the protests there. What's really interesting is people who have set up the protests against, um, when Netanyahu visited London, there was a huge protest against him outside Downing Street. And the people who actually organized that protest were Israelis living in London. And I know that's true for other countries as well. Now the Israeli community um, kind of, I don't want to say functions, but it, it's it's different to the Jewish community and it, it's it's um, a little bit less political. Um, it, it's not necessarily merged as one with the, the Jewish community in the UK, for example. It's, it's a little bit separate. And it's really interesting to see Israelis abroad mobilizing in this way, in a way that they, they wouldn't have before. Um, and, and I think that's really telling. I think it puts a lot of pressure on the Jewish community. Um, I think the Jewish community is it doesn't mean the Jewish community isn't going to be Zionist or not support Israel as a concept. Um, however, I think it's it's forcing the community to ask itself a lot of really difficult questions and questions that we we ought to be asking ourselves. Um, of you know, you kind of do have to choose a side in this instance. It's really it's really difficult to stay silent when so many Israelis are saying. If you want Israel to exist as a Jewish democracy, you're going to have to stand up and protest with us because that's what's at stake here. It's not a question of do you support Netanyahu, do you support Gantz, do you support Lapid? It's what is the character of the Jewish state that you want? And I think it has pressed more people and more figures in the Jewish community in the UK and globally to be asking difficult questions, to be challenging. Um, I mean, again, maybe it's not my ideal uh, outcome, but when the Board of Deputies met with the diaspora minister, they were very clear that it wasn't, you know, a warm handshake conversation, but that they posed very difficult questions to him. Is that my idea? Is a left wing Israeli? No, I would love them to have a stronger response, but it's a, it, it's a very different way of handling it than they have in the past. Um, and I think that's interesting, and I hope that pressure continues to to make people ask difficult questions. And so I want to talk a little bit about the relationship with the protest movement and sort of, I guess, wider civil society within Israel and also within Palestine. And um, there was an interesting interview that Navarra Media did uh, recently with the uh, the Palestine, Palestinian ambassador to the UK on a whole bunch of topics. But one of the things that was interesting about that interview was um, he was asked whether the protest movement in Israel is Um, giving, uh, I guess, more strength and support to the anti-occupation initiatives and um, whether the Palestinian ambassador saw hope in the Israeli protest movement helping to shift uh, attitudes towards the occupation. And uh, interestingly, that they said that actually they didn't feel like those links and connections were being made within the protest movement. I wonder whether, I guess, firstly, whether you agree with that, but secondly, also, as you know, Someone working with Yakad, which you know is is concerned around the occupation and um, and and the conflict. Whether you think that um, that that ought to be taking place, where where those links are being made between this set of particularly regressive um, policies from Netanyahu's government and their uh, kind of occupation when it comes to Palestine. Yeah, it's a really good and fair and very complicated question. And I'll say, I completely respect the ambassador's view that. Um, as a Palestinian, and I can't speak as a Palestinian, clearly what is happening is not nearly touching on the occupation enough. The protests are focused on internal Israeli politics, and they aren't focused on the occupation. I think that's really clear. You see that it's uh, Israeli flags. The protest movement has made a very big effort to make it clear that it's pro-Israel in the kind of traditional sense. So I will say it's not making the link enough. I don't think it's fair to say that there hasn't been a link made to occupation. Um, So first of all, every protest and 
especially in Tel Aviv, there has been a very substantial anti-occupation bloc. And you see organizations like Peace Now, Breaking the Silence, Standing Together, um, and others, I won't try to name them all, are, are making their presence felt um, and ensuring that they are talking about the occupation and making the link. Because ultimately, a huge part of what's happening in this judicial reform, this far-right government, is clearly an attempt to, um, if not deepen the occupation, uh, completely create a situation where we are unquestionably in an apartheid state. Um, and that's been very made very clear. I mean, Minister uh, Itamar Ben-Gvir, um, who's Minister for National Security, who's a far-right politician, has said that his kind of vision, and he said this not long ago before the election towards the end of last year, would be um, annexation whereby Palestinians who want to be peaceful and not cause conflict can stay, but they won't be given a right to vote. So they will be second class citizens. And it, it's, this government has made it very clear what its attitude towards Palestinians is. It doesn't have any in intent on working towards a two state solution. There have been countless outposts in the West Bank being legalized to become settlements. It, it, this, is a, this is a pro occupation, pro annexation government. What I think, though, is that more and more people are are realizing that. I think that some of the conversation that I've seen, if you look at Israeli media, is picking up on that more. Um, one of the former heads of uh, the Shin Bet, the in Israeli intelligence services, um, has said that the biggest risk in this government is exactly that block, the the, the pro-annexation, pro-apartheid block. And so it's, it's inserting this conversation is happening far more than I've ever seen it before in the mainstream. But I completely accept that for Palestinians, it's not nearly enough. It's very fair for me as an Israeli to say, give us time. We have to shift the conversation. It's going to take a while. But for a Palestinian where your your homeland is being completely destroyed and your rights are being taken away, it's, I don't expect the Palestinians to be patient with us. Um, the, the other just one thing I wanted to point out on that is the biggest shift I saw in attitudes was with what happened in the Palestinian village of Hawara, um, where the settlers went in and rampaged and essentially did a pogrom against Palestinians. And the chant that came out of that in the Israeli protest was chanting towards the police, where were you in Hawara? And that's actually be remains a chant in protest. And I think the link is starting, it's not there yet, but it's starting to be made where there's protesters saying, wait a minute, who are the police protecting? Who are the government protecting? Who are the security services there for? Is it for us as peaceful pro-democracy citizens, but not for the settlers who are violent towards Palestinians? Um, and so I don't accept that the conversation isn't happening, and I don't accept that there is a shift, but I completely accept that it's not nearly enough. And so finally then, um, just on that last point, given, I guess, what's happened over the last week, uh, I guess, since since I first kind of, we, we first agreed to this interview, uh, we've obviously seen the the, the raids on the Al-Aqsa Mosque in East Jerusalem um, again during the month of Ramadan. We've seen the airstrikes in Lebanon and Gaza and so on. Um, I guess you've talked there about some shifting of attitudes in Israel towards the occupation and, and the interlinking of that to the, the protest movement. Do you do you think that the the, the these these kinds of acts that we're seeing from uh, like with the raid on the Alexa Mosque and the, the the airstrikes and so on, is uh, is also starting to shift attitudes um, as well. So it's really interesting. I think, unfortunately, I'll say with Alexa, no, um, because it's the the this government has not invented the the violence at Alexa. We've seen it happen before. We saw violence at Alexa under previous governments, and I think that that's something Israelis haven't quite wrapped their head around. I'm not sure it's being reported as well as it should be in the media and explained as well as it should be. But I think when people look at the increase in at what's happening with Lebanon um, and also the, the kind of persistent violence that isn't bringing us anywhere, I do think questions are being started to be asked. Um, also questions, again, around the, it's not just about the explosions and the shootings, it's about the building of more settlements which this government sees as kind of, you know, many people in this government see as the goal, how is that benefiting people's security? Because actually it's clearly, it's an act of provocation, it's a, it's an act of violence. Um, and so I would say, I don't think Alexa as a moment in time will shift attitudes, but I do think there's a wider question around people seeing uh, 
a violent government acting violently and not protecting them in any way. And so it's always going to be citizens who suffer. And I think the way in which this government is operating, one, is, is ineffective, um, isn't taken seriously, and two, is, is hurting people. Um, and so I, I wouldn't, there's, there's few moments in time I would pin it down to, but I think there's an overall big picture of people kind of starting to, to see that um, having an impact on their lives. I'll let you get on now with the rest of your day, but thank you so much for joining us and for, yeah, the really informative and enlightening uh, contributions you've made. But yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me.